In just a minute, we're going on an exploration the likes of which you have only seen on futuristic television shows. We're going to take a ride on the internet, and today our destination is the World Wide Web. So grab your surfboards, internauts. We're going to hang ten. tapes we've experienced the power of the internet and learned to use its many tools we've sent and received email used FTP to transfer text and graphic files and used gopher and Veronica to search the vast resources of the internet until today though we've never come across one of these an intersection that's because in our previous journeys none of the information roadways we traveled ever crossed on the World Wide Web, all of the Internet's information is allowed to come together in a kind of global information intersection. You see, if we were on the World Wide Web right now, down there, that would be Japan. Over there, Germany. Over my shoulder, that's the solar system. But down here is, well... Is your classroom. You see, on the web, all the resources of the internet are linked interactively, all under the arrow of your mouse. I'll show you in just a minute. First of all, we're going to be doing a research project. Okay, gang. What you're going to be doing is pairing up with your study partner, and you're going to be picking out one of the nine planets. In that assignment, you're going to be telling us about the orbits of the uh, planet you pick, features about it, things about the planet we've learned from the Hubble te telescope and other space probes. Include in it pictures, drawings, any AV materials like that. You'll see on the board a list of reference books that you can use. John. Um, can we use the, the computer labs? Sure, the computer lab would be really good. Hypercard, that sort of thing would be a great presentation. So, pair up with your partner, and I need you to uh, pick up your assignments on your way out, gang. Take it easy, make sure you know what planet. Hey, I'll see you in the lab, and we can get on the net. You know, I know a really cool gopher site where we can get some really good information on the subject. Oh, cool. Yeah. Can you hear yeah, that? They're trying to kill us. Maybe we should try the computer. Look, my dad has every National Geographic since I don't know, before electricity. So we're still on pictures and stuff like that. And all the reference books we need are in the library. Star Trek. Well, I know this really cool FTP site where you can get some really cool graphics. Ah, have you ever surfed the web? The what? Have I got something to show you? See in the lab after math class. See ya. Maybe we should check out the computer lab. Look, all they're going to do is have some data and crunchy pictures. I happen to know the library got some new NASA tapes. Nobody else is going to have a video. Bunch of data. Crunchy pictures. These guys haven't seen the web. Now here on my computer, I've accessed the World Wide Web using a program called a web browser. And there are probably a lot of things that may look a little unfamiliar to you here. And I'll try to describe it all to you in just a bit. But I just happen to know a place where... Ah, the Nine Planets, a multimedia tour. Now how cool is this? There's pictures. Let's see. Here's a little bit about the author of the site. And notice that some of the text is blue. That's the secret to the web. Those are the information intersections, or links. I'll take a look at all this stuff. Every planet and their moons in order from the sun. And I think I saw, up here near the top, yeah, it's an overview of the solar system. I'll just click on those words, and here we go. Each of the nine planets, stuff about their orbits, and hey, pretty cool. A great graphic of all nine all together. Now, let's get some more detail about each planet. We'll back up one page and let me see here. How about Saturn? I'll just click on the word Saturn and check this out. It's a great graphic there too. And what's this? There's a little speaker inside of a blue box. I wonder what happens when I click on that. Let's try it. pretty cool. Now here are all the facts about Saturn. 
Who's visited by Voyager? Hmm, that word's in blue too. I'll click on that. Well, take a look at this. Images of the spacecraft, information about when it was launched, and what's this? Here's some video clips of the Hubble Space Telescope repair. I gotta see this. Are you kidding? Where'd you get this stuff? Check that, oh, check that out right there. What, this? Yeah, that right there. Ah, oh, check this out. This web stuff is so wild, so easy to use. All you do is click on these blue things and... Oh, look cool. Oh, oh, this is Pluto. We're doing Venus. I know, but look, it, it looks neat. Hey, wait, check that down there. Yeah, uh, right there. You'll quickly discover the power and the problem with the World Wide Web. It's so easy to find information that's so cool to look at and hear that you'll probably lose all track of time and what you came online to search for in the first place. Where have you been? I need help going through all this stuff. I'm sorry, I saw this book and it looked interesting. Satellite television? What's that? It was over next to the Saturn book, so I picked it up. You're killing me, man. I need help going through all this stuff. Okay. Look. Right there. The beautiful part about the web is that even though you can get lost in your information quest, it's always easy to find your way back. Now let me show you how it works. Remember those blue words that I was clicking on? Earlier, I referred to them as information intersections. Actually, it's called a hyperlink. It sounds like outer space, doesn't it? Well, it's easy to understand, and better than that, as you saw, even easier to use. Now, having used Gopher and its search tool Veronica as your primary means of internet navigation, you know that to find what you're looking for, you follow a very straight and organized path. You make selections for menu items that give you more and more choices until you've reached your final destination. A single computer file among the hundreds of millions of other files on the net. The end of that information pass road. Sometimes, as I'm sure you've discovered, it's hard to know whether you've made the right choices along the way. You don't know if your search will uncover what you want until you've reached your final destination. And if what you got isn't what you wanted, or if you'd like more information than you found in that file, you have to go back to your point of departure and start over or choose a different road. Now, the World Wide Web is different. On the web, all the paths of information are allowed to crisscross over and over until there seems to be no beginning and no end. The effect starts to look like, well, a spider web. Wherever the information crosses or intersects, a link is formed, tying that information to the rest of the web. And those links, well, they look like this on your screen, blue words or phrases. And if you look inside this web page, though, you'll see that the author used a kind of programming language called hypertext markup language, or HTML. When you attach an HTML code to a keyword or phrase on the document's page, it links that word to the address of another resource. Now, that could be another file in your computer or files from any computer on the internet. HTML links that resource to the word or phrase, creating a hyperlink, the blue words. Beside the blue words, another tip off to a hyperlink is when your mouse arrow becomes a hand, like this. Anytime that happens, just click, and you've hyperlinked to whatever address is hidden in the HTML code. And as you can see, clicking on one hyperlink transports you to a page with more hyperlinks. And that one will take you to another and another. And before you know it, you're on a fantastic voyage on the World Wide Web. Pretty cool, huh? Now, hyperlinks aren't always attached to just text. See this image? It has a blue box around it. And my mouse arrow? There's the tip off. It's turned into a hand. By clicking on this image, you link to another and it could link to another. And remember the sound file we heard a little while ago? It was also a hyperlink to a sound file somewhere else in that computer. So as you can see, navigating the web is as easy as clicking on the hyperlinks. Now, hypertext markup language, or HTML, is not difficult to learn. And while it is outside the scope of this tape, it is the way you can make your own hyperlink documents on the web. Whose idea was this anyway? I don't want to hear it. I found your NASA tapes, all four hours of them. They're cool, okay, but we're never going to get through this stuff. Yeah, there's a lot. We should get together tonight to organize it. Great. Wow, I can't believe you found all this stuff in one place. It's not really in one place. It's just one web page on a website linked to a jillion more. They're all over the place. Yeah, whatever. Well, scroll down. I want to see more of this. Wait, here, give me that. 
Okay, so what's a web page? Well, it's simply one web file among many that live in a web server computer known as a website. Remember, the web does not replace the other internet tools like Gopher and FTP. It's really in addition to them. And as you'll see, it can actually incorporate them as well. And remember from our previous tapes, when computers communicate with one another, they require a transmission language known as a protocol. In essence, the protocol tells the receiving computer what kind of activity you want to perform. So when you FTP, for example, or transfer a file, you precede the computer and file address with the letters FTP. FTP, that's the protocol. Think of it this way. In order to get breakfast every morning, you have to ask for it in French. To have lunch, order it in German. And a snack, try Japanese. And later for dinner, well, that might be Russian. So if each language was the protocol for a particular meal, the protocol for breakfast would be French. It's the same idea on the internet. If you want to FTP, your computer needs to speak in the language the receiving computer can understand. That's the transmission protocol. Well, the web is no different. The protocol for communicating with a website is called Hypertext Transport Protocol, or HTTP. It's called that because you're communicating with hyperlinks. So let's visit another website. This time, let's take a look at the Thomas Database, which is the complete collection of the House of Representatives and Senate bills, as well as the Congressional Record. Now, like anything on the internet, you first need to know the address of the place you want to go. If you don't know the address, there are search tools on the web, which I'll show you in just a minute. Now, my web browser program is called Netscape, and I'm running it on a Macintosh. And there are a number of web browsers available for both Mac and Windows, and they all work pretty much the same, and they all look pretty much the same. So to enter an address, if you know it, go up to the top of your screen and click on the Open button. And then a small window appears, and in it, you type the address of the place you want to go. In this case, it's HTTP colon slash slash Thomas dot L-O-C dot gov. Now, let's take a look at that for a minute. HTTP is the hypertext transport protocol that we just talked about, and it's always typed in lower case. It tells the receiving computer that we want to access documents written with HTML. Remember the hypertext markup language or the hyperlinks? Now, following the HTTP is a colon and two forward slashes. Now, they're unique to the web. They turn the address into a universal language that all of the different servers on the net can understand. Now, that sounds a little complicated, but it's really not. Remember, the web is just the crisscrossing of all the Internet's resources, not just from websites, but from every server or computer on the Internet. And remember that different activities require different protocols. So what happens when this information crosses? Yep. There are going to be some major information pileups, unless, of course, you have some kind of traffic control. So the people that develop the hyperlinks also developed a universal language that allows the web browser to access and speak in all protocols. It's called a Universal Resource Locator, or URL for short. So anything you address from a web browser is called a URL, and it requires that the colon and two slashes follow the protocol. Here, let me get into the Thomas database and I'll show you what I mean. After the HTTP colon slash slash, the address looks just like the kind you're already accustomed to using. Click on open, and here we are. Now take a look at this page. Here are the hyperlinks to all the House and Senate bills. Down here are the full text of the congressional record. And even down a little bit farther, is a great document describing how our laws are made here in the United States. All of them are hyperlinks. And check this out, a hyperlink to a gopher site. And look down here at the bottom of the screen. See, when my cursor is on a hyperlink, the address of the server and file appear down here at the bottom. That's where this hyperlink links to. Let's click on this and we're in what looks like a regular gopher site. Now, look up at our address window. See, the protocol has automatically changed. Now, instead of saying HTTP, it's gopher, followed by the colon and two forward slashes. After the gopher colon slash slash, of course, the address looks just like a regular gopher site. 
That's because, well, it is. And you could access it from your Gopher software. But remember, this one is hyperlinked to the Thomas homepage. Warning, warning, another new term, homepage. Let me show you what I mean. Let's check out another website, the Shakespeare headquarters. Now, I could go back up here to open location and then type in the URL address, but this time I've used a shortcut up here under the bookmark menu. Any time in your surfing that you find a cool place that you would like to visit later, while you're there, just click on bookmarks and then add, and it's saved for future use. So as you can see, I already have the Shakespeare homepage in my bookmark. So let's click on it and away we go. Now check out this address. It's a pretty long one because this is one file among thousands in a very large website database. That's why using the bookmark can be handy. You don't have to memorize the URL. And remember, URL addresses, like all other addresses on the internet, must be typed exactly using periods, hyphens, capitals, lowercase, exactly as they're shown. If you mess up, your computer won't be very happy with you. Anyway, here we are at the Shakespeare homepage, which, as you can see from the URL address, is at a website at MIT in the Shakespeare subdirectory, and this file, works, is in that subdirectory. Notice, too, that the file has an extension .html. That's right, it's a hypertext file. Now, anytime you access a website, the first thing you'll get is its home page. It's kind of like the table of contents. It lets you browse all the information available on that site and establishes all the hyperlinks to that information. So, as you can see here, all of Shakespeare's works are represented from his plays to his poetry, as well as other related information on Shakespeare. The cool thing about this site, though, is not just the fact that the collected works of Shakespeare, and there are a lot, are all here, but that you can hyperlink to any one of them, like Romeo and Juliet. Even more cool than that is that the glossary is hyperlinked to the text so that any of the words that are unusual to Shakespeare's style of writing or that have unusual meanings are in blue. Click on the blue word and you're in the glossary. Makes it a whole lot easier to read Shakespeare. You got all that stuff? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wait, you have that black book? What black book? There's a million black books. You know, the one with the Hubble on. So you think we should include this? Yeah, definitely. We'll put it in right after you show them the orbital position chart. Great. We're all set. All you gotta do is read that stuff that I printed out for you for the presentation. And don't forget, tomorrow we're gonna meet after school. All right. Before we go on, take a look at the top of my screen, at the icons. Since you're becoming web surfers, let me show you some of the navigation essentials. The first and most important one is this. Back. You'll quickly discover as you follow one link to another to another, you may want to retrace your steps to check out something you saw along the way. Or in this case, get us back from the glossary to the text of Romeo and Juliet. So click on back and there you are. Next to back is forward, which does the same thing the other way, of course. You'll find these buttons really handy as you move back and forth from one page to another. Now, another way to go forward is to use the go menu. When you pull it down, it shows you the history of all the places you've been. Some are listed by address and some by a title. In either case, to return to any of the pages, just click on the one you want and you're there. Now the home icon will return you to the first page that loaded when you started your software. Every so often you'll find that a page won't load properly. This is usually due to a very large or complex image. In that case, click on Reload to load that page again. The Images icon can be helpful in increasing the speed of your surfing. Now, Netscape automatically loads the images on web pages, but when the images are complex, they will load very slowly. Netscape can be reconfigured to load the images only when you click on the Images icon. You'll find that this can speed things up. Now, Open we've already discussed, and Print is, well, Print. But the find icon can be pretty interesting. Click on it and you'll be asked to type in a word or a group of words. Once done, clicking on find will highlight all the references to your request in the current document. Now that can be really helpful for locating a reference in a document as large as a Shakespearean play. 
Finally, use the stop icon if, while you're loading a large document or image, you realize that it just isn't what you want or it's taking too long. One more thing and we'll do a little surfing. If you don't have the URL address for a website, you can use the web search tools very much as you would Veronica, the search tool for Gopher sites. Now up here in the menu bar, click on directory and among other things you'll see internet search. Clicking on it will give you a number of different web crawlers or search tools that allow you to enter a keyword. Here's about half a dozen of the most popular web search tools and they're all pretty much the same. So let's do a search using web crawler. That's an actual search tool. And in the dialog box it appears, I'll type Shakespeare. And click on search. And there's the results. Now, there are two differences between web searching and searching by Veronica. Veronica searches for keyword matches only in the menus of Gopher sites. But on the web, the search is expanded to include the contents of any file that particular search program can access. So here we are, references to Shakespeare, and here's the Shakespeare homepage. The other difference between this and Gopher, these matches are actually hyperlinked. So one click, and away we go. Pretty cool, huh? Now again, your program may be slightly different from mine, but all these tools and icons will be available to you, perhaps not laid out in quite the same way, and you'll have to investigate the different search tools as well as some of the other options in your program the next time you go surfing. But now, let's check out another website that I know you'll like, the Virtual Frog Dissection Kit. But be careful how you enter the URL address because this is a real long one. This site is at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. That's the LBL in the URL address, and while it is at the University of California in Berkeley, it's managed by the U.S. Department of Energy. That explains the .gov on the end. So in reality, this is the computer where the dissection kit lives. It's inside of this directory, then this directory, and this is the actual file we have pulled up, info.html. Now, if you get in the habit of using your bookmark when you come across an interesting site, it'll save you from typing in all of this. So let's take a look at this page. You can find out more about the lab and the authors of this site by surfing around here at the bottom of the page. But here's one cool thing though here at the top of the page. This is a hyperlink to other languages. With just a couple of clicks you can translate this entire site into Spanish, German, even Dutch. Remember, the web really is worldwide. Anyway, this program will give you the ability to explore the anatomy of a frog using data from magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, combined with 3D animation. An MRI is like an x-ray, but it allows you to see the organs, not just the skeleton. And for those of you who don't like sticking your hands in real dead frogs, this site is for you. So let's click on start. And here we are, an image of a frog. Now, you have a lot of choices to make here. Up top is a pop-down menu allowing you to choose the frog size and whether you want to view it from the top or the bottom. Down here is where you start to perform the real dissection. Another pop-down lets you choose whether you want the skin on, off, or just a cutout section, like a window. And these checkboxes allow you to view, remove, or single out any of these possibilities. So watch this. Let's keep all the organs on, but remove the skin. Go over here to the pop down, choose off, and then come back up here and click on send. Now because there are so many choices available in this program, the authors decided on a send button so the images wouldn't have to update each time you make a choice, slowing the whole thing down. And here we are, the skeleton of a frog with all of its organs. Now if you wanted say to single out just the nervous system, come down here to the bottom and deselect the organs you don't want. So we'll take out the eyes, brain, all the way down the line, heart, stomach. When you're done, come back up to the top and click on send. And here you are, just the skeleton. Now, you can do this with any of the anatomical combinations and view them from the top or the bottom and as a cutaway. Let me show you. We'll leave everything else the same, but come down here to the skin pop down and select cut. Then we'll go back to the top and click on send. 
and now you have a cutaway, a window into the frog. But here's the really cool part. Let's take a look at a 3D rotating model of our frog. Maybe this time of just the skeleton. First, we'll keep all the different organs deselected that we don't want to see. Leave the skeleton turned on, take the skin off, and then come down here to the Movies button. We'll go ahead and turn those on, go back to the top, and select Send. Great, now we've got our skeleton here in the window, and down below, we have a whole new group of windows that have appeared. These are the rotation angles you can choose for the 3D movies. Let's see, how about this one on the end? It should put the frog nose up and rotate it counterclockwise. Now over here is the quality pop-down box. You can choose any quality level for the 3D image, but remember, these files are pretty big, so the better the quality, the longer it will take to load and the slower it will play. Now I'm going to leave it in default for now, and you can experiment with the different qualities when you try this yourself. And because we have movies turned on, notice that each of the trajectory boxes have a blue outline. Yep, they're hyperlinks. That means that in this case, when you make your selection, you don't have to press the send button. Okay, let's click on this one, and you'll see that the box is replaced by another hyperlink. This is the kind and size of the file. Many of the animations and videos that you'll encounter on the web are in MPEG format. The video files are extremely large and must be compressed so that you can view or download them without waiting until tomorrow or completely filling up your hard drive. Now, MPEG has been adopted as the standard for video compression, and this file size is about 165K, which is pretty small. Let's go ahead and play it. After we click on it, the file is actually sent to our computer to an MPEG player. That's some special software that's sitting on my hard drive that my web browser will grab while the information is coming down, and then it'll play the movie for us. And here comes the movie. The software chews on it a little bit, displays it to us, and then allows us to press play. Here's the movie, and we can start it playing. Now, you can do this with any combination of organs and the cutaway window and in any of the rotation angles available, doing it from the top or from the bottom. You can also download these MPEG files for later review or incorporate them in a class project. Now, speaking of class projects, I wonder how the solar system presentations are going. And so you see, Mars is the fourth planet from the sun, and it's really cold, and we're not sending anyone there real soon. Nick? Mm, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that report, guys. Next up are John and Betty with uh, Venus. Okay. Well, first, uh, we have to get some idea of the distance relationship between Venus and the planet we just saw, Mars, and of course to us. As you can see, here is a view of Venus. Now, Venus is the second planet away from the sun. Its radius is about 3,800 miles, three-fourths the size of the Earth. So there you have it, the World Wide Web. But we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of all the neat places we'll go and all the cool things you'll see and learn. So, wait or not, get out there and surf. Harnessing the power of the World Wide Web will take some experimenting, some surfing. As you saw, it's really easy to dive into a website, write it to any destination, and get home again, just with a few simple mouse clicks. Most of the work is done by the HTML, the hypertext markup language that creates the hyperlinks. And before you know it, you'll find that you'll be using the web for a lot of your work on the internet.